All right, guys, we need to wrap up our little mini lectures here for module number four, the anxiety disorders. Again, this is a very broad family of mental health conditions and commonly experienced, therefore commonly diagnosed. I didn't say this in earlier videos, but I'll just say this and is, is just this, you know someone, my hunch is just like depression. Uh, you know someone today, my hunch is, who probably struggles at some level with patterns of unhealthy anxiety, stress, or panic, or whatever it may be. Maybe it's obsessive compulsive disorder or PTSD, which we'll talk about in the next module. But maybe it's one of, uh, or a combination of some kinds of struggles like we're talking about in this section with these five different real core foundational anxiety related kinds of conditions that again, can look a bunch of different ways in people's lives, but are very, very, very common. Specific phobias, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and then in this video, let's cover the last two, agoraphobia and generalized anxiety disorder. Now, agoraphobia is kind of easy in a way for us to understand because it's got the word phobia in it, and we've already talked about phobias. So phobias are fears. These are distinct, persistent, marked and persistent fears of specific persons, places, objects, or situations that are outside the realm of typical and appropriate that almost always produce immediate anxiety or fear whenever I'm exposed to whatever it is I'm fearful of. There's patterns of active avoidance or stressful endurance. They're persistent and chronic. They cause some level of disruption, fears and phobias. Well, agoraphobia is, if, is a phobia, as you can tell from its name, but it is an interesting phobia and it's a long story as to why agoraphobia gets its own name, so to speak. We don't call, when people have agoraphobia, from just a purely, from a purely um, diagnostic approach, we actually diagnose them specifically with this phobia, and we don't call it a specific phobia. That's a whole other story for a whole other day. But agoraphobia kind of gets its own name, so to speak, in the DSM. Agoraphobia is a marked and persistent fear of social, open, or crowded situations where escape may be difficult. So you probably heard of claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is where people have a fear of tight, confined spaces. Agoraphobia and claustrophobia, to me, I call them cousins. They're different, but they're kind of similar. Agoraphobia is a fear that people often have of being in large, open, crowded spaces. And my, the fear is not people being pressed up against me. The fear is people get preoccupied in their mind with agoraphobia on how am I going to get out of here if I want to get out of here? That's their fear. Maybe you've known someone. I've had people uh, who I've worked with. I've had people I've known before. This was kind of their fear. You know, all of us have kind of a fear, right? Some of us are afraid of snakes. Some of us are afraid of spiders. Some of us are afraid of heights or needles or injections or whatever it may be. Some people, this is their fear. Their fear is they freak out. They get really terrified in any situation where I might be stuck, where I don't have the control to get out of here unless I wanted to. So that's a key idea. Open, often crowded public spaces. But really the key idea is not the fact that it's crowded. It's just how am I going to get out of here if I wanted to get out of here? So we see agoraphobia in many, many ways. So number one, people with agoraphobia, for example, do not like like public transportation, like crowded buses. Um, they don't, they, they get really anxious standing in long lines. Uh, they get really stressed out, like a former student of mine told, shared with, uh, we, when I was teaching this class, I don't know, five or six years ago, and I was talking about agoraphobia, it, what we're doing right now, the student shared that this was kind of her fear. And she said, my thing is I get totally panicked when there's a traffic jam. She said, I don't know why. But when there's a traffic jam and I am stuck, there's a car in front of me and a car behind me and I am stuck. She said, I start freaking out. I don't know what it is about that. She said, I'm not afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of bugs or snakes. She said, that is my fear. That really is agoraphobia because the fear is how am I going to get out of here if I wanted to get out of here? And so this idea of escape, that's the key idea with agoraphobia. People with agoraphobia then therefore may avoid crowded open spaces. They may have kind of this thing about sitting on the end of an aisle, like in church or concerts. They may avoid concerts, but if they go, they stand to the back, they stand to the side so that they're not, so that they can kind of get out and kind of escape if they want to. Now, here's the thing. Um, we're going to talk in the next module about post-traumatic stress disorder. 
And so a lot of people have agoraphobia kinds of symptoms because of trauma and stress. And so therefore they're real leery about open spaces because they want to get out of here if they want to get out here. So maybe like in a classroom, they sit towards the front door all the time. When they go into a restaurant, they always sit where they can face the door. That, that kind of sounds a little bit like agoraphobia. It could be. But again, agoraphobia is a phobia. And so, so we would not diagnose agoraphobia in a person if they had a previous stressful or traumatic event that was causing their fear. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about post-traumatic stress disorder in the next module about how people who have PTSD sometimes can get kind of leery about how am I going to get out of here if I want to get out of here. Well, that's called post-traumatic stress disorder. Agoraphobia is like my former student who was sharing with me about her, her fear of being stuck in traffic. I just asked her in front of the entire class. I said, can I ask you a couple of questions? A little diagnosis. She's like, no, go ahead. I said, have you ever been like in a car accident where you were like trapped? Because that could cause that. And she said, no. I said, okay. I said, have you ever been like, um, I mean, I don't know. She said, I said, have you ever had this when you were a child? I said, were you ever in a situation like that, like in a traffic jam? And maybe, I don't know, you got sick or maybe someone got hurt or whatever. She said, no, I don't know why I'm afraid She said, she's of that. She said, that's just what freaks me out. See, that's a, that's a phobia where we're, I'm not, I'm not sure why that, I'm not sure why whenever I stand in line, like a long line, I start kind of getting preoccupied with, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if I want to get out of here? Sometimes with agoraphobia, it, it, it shows itself like with flying. People sometimes can, may say, I'm afraid of flying, getting on an airplane. I usually will say, well, what about getting on an airplane? It's real terrifying to you. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to crash. right? I don't like heights. A lot of people are afraid of flying because they don't want to get on an airplane because once the door is closed, how am I going to get off this thing if I want to get off? That's more agoraphobia, actually, right? So agoraphobia can kind of show itself in all kinds of ways. Occasionally, maybe you've heard of this. I've had students ask me this before. They'll say, Professor Killian, isn't agoraphobia that fear where people don't leave their house? They've, they become like homebound. And the answer is sometimes yes. So sometimes both with social anxiety disorder and with agoraphobia, with really, really with several phobias, um, but with social anxiety disorder, which we've already talked about, and with agoraphobia, people may, may even, it may be so severe that people become homebound because they're so afraid of leaving the house uh, because how am I gonna get back here if I wanna get back here? And so oftentimes people get preoccupied with that when it comes to their fear. So agoraphobia is a marked and persistent fear or phobia of a specific situation. What's the situation? The situation is open, crowded public spaces, really any situation where I get preoccupied in my mind, how am I gonna get out of here if I wanna get, how am I gonna escape? It could people then, therefore, for example, may be real leery of like grocery stores or malls. And again, it doesn't have to be super crowded, but they just may get preoccupied in their mind of, hey, I got, how am I going to get out of here if I want to get out of here? And so, so people with agoraphobia oftentimes begin to feel kind of smothered. They begin to kind of begin to freak out a little bit. So if you maybe you've known someone with agoraphobia, another feature is oftentimes if they're put in situations like a church or a concert or a crowded mall where it gets really, really, really crowded, even if people aren't pushing up against it. Because sometimes, again, remember, agoraphobia and claustrophobia are real similar. Um, sometimes, people, sometimes people freak out in crowded spaces because they feel like they're being smothered and people are up against them. That could be claustrophobia. But people with agoraphobia, they may not have anyone around them at all, but maybe the, maybe the, the, the place where they are generally is really crowded with people. And they may begin to freak out thinking, I got to get out of here. I just got to get out of here. And they, got, and, they, and they have to get outside, get into their car, like to their safe place or get home or whatever it may be. So agoraphobia is a common kind of a fear that we oftentimes see. Just real quickly, one of the reasons why agoraphobia gets its own name in the DSM is because it is commonly co-occurring with panic disorder. Let me just talk about that for a little bit. So remember panic disorder from last module, from our last video? So panic disorder is a mental health condition characterized by patterns of consistent, persistent, chronic patterns of unexpected, unexplained panic attacks. And you may remember that in panic disorder, that one of the things I said, one of the other features is people begin as a result of their panic attacks to begin to change their behavior patterns uh, as a result of having panic attacks. And so one of the things that we sometimes see with panic disorder is people can then develop agoraphobia as a result of their panic disorder, if that makes sense. So as a result of having unexpected, unexplained panic attacks, I then, I then stop going to the store. 
because what am I going to do if I get in the back part of the store and I have a panic attack? How am I going to get out of here? And so in a way, panic disorder can like evolve or can add agoraphobia sometimes. So those two can kind of run together. In that instance, panic disorder comes first and then agoraphobia develops second. We see that sometimes, uh, although agoraphobia just by itself can be just a standalone phobia. So agoraphobia, again, is a phobia of agora. The term agora means the marketplace. It's an old Latin Greek term that just means open the, the, the marketplace, right? And so agoraphobia is a fear of the marketplace. And it, it describes a situation where a person has an intense, uh, out, of the, out, out of proportion, in, inappropriate fear of crowded or public spaces where escape may be difficult. So again, we see people struggling with crowded transportation, airplanes, crowded spaces. And the key idea is they get, they get preoccupied with the idea of how am I going to get out of here if I want to get out of here? So, so far we've covered four of these anxiety related disorders, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia. Fifth one is this one, generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorders on page 222 in the DSM-5. Uh, to me, generalized anxiety disorder, again, I want you to be familiar with this diagnosis. It's a very important diagnosis to be familiar with. Um, some disorders listed for us in the DSM-5 are very, very narrow. And so as far as how they look and the way that symptoms are, they're very, very narrow. Other disorders in the DSM are very broad. So the spe so specific phobia is very, very broad. Here's another one that's very, very broad. Generalized anxiety disorder is a diagnosis. It's a very, very old diagnosis. And I want you to be familiar with it because occasionally students will always ask me about GAD or generalized anxiety disorder. Let me ask you this question. And maybe you are the person that, you, that, may, that may come to your mind. Have you ever known anyone who was a worry wart or someone who was just an excessive worrier? I've, I've, I've known people like that. You know, I've, I've counseled people like that. That, that within them, there was this chronic low-grade anxiety all the time. And they were just worriers. Um, I've heard people say before, you know, there are some people in the world that, you know, they're not comfortable unless they're worrying. You know, if, if they don't have anything to worry about, they're going to find something to worry about. And so there are people in our world today, Freud used to call them neurotic. Back in the early days of Freud's counseling, he developed this term called neurosis. And Freud used the term neurotic to refer to his clients who were always worrying about something. They may, they may not have like a phobia. Maybe they did. They weren't having panic attacks, but they were always worrying about something. And their worry was excessive and it was just inappropriate. It was just, and, and, and it was across multiple settings. So what we oftentimes refer to as free floating anxiety. Free floating anxiety is the person who worries about my finances, even though my finances are fine. I worry about my kids, even though my kids are fine. I get preoccupied that my kids are going to get ill and sick, even though they're healthy. I worry about my husband and his health, even though he's, he's well, or my wife's health, even though she's fine. I worry about my job, even though I just got promoted. My job is going great. I still worry. I still find a way to worry about and stress over losing my job, even though I've never lost my job, right? But I, maybe you know someone, but I worry about that. You know, I worry about um, us being able to, you know, uh, family members, even though there's no really, really wor reason to worry about family members. Maybe you know someone. So, so all of that is generalized, what we call generalized anxiety. And generalized anxiety disorder is, again, just persistent, persistent, excessive patterns of what we call free-floating anxiety, where people worry about multiple situations, not just one, multiple situations inappropriately, to the level that it creates a disruption in their lives. And DSM gives us several examples. So for example, is the worry severe enough that they're having sleep problems, that they're having some health problems, that it's creating relationship problems or work kind of related problems? Um, is, is, it, is the pattern of worrying that intense and that persistence that rises to that level to where it's become disruptive in people's lives and it's been chronic for about two years or so. So again, this is a pretty broad kind of a diagnosis. So this is kind of a person who we would say has kind of like a lifestyle of anxiety, a lifestyle of worry. Now here's a key thing that's important to generalize anxiety disorder, because again, all of us have anxiety and stress in our lives. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder is somewhat subjective. And here's what I mean by that. You just gotta use your common sense. Generalized anxiety disorder is a diagnosis that we would use when a person is worrying about something that the context tells us 
they shouldn't be worrying about. So for example, um, the example I gave in your lecture notes is this. If you have a client who comes in and they talk to you about their stress, about their son and about their finances and about their marriage, and you say, well, tell me why you're worried about that. Let's say that they tell you that their, their son, their child has been diagnosed with some form, rare form of cancer and that, that they're waiting on tests to come back. And then they also, too, say, I'm worried about my job because they're laying everybody off. And my boss told me that no one's job is safe. And I'm worried about my marriage because my husband and I are fighting all the time. And we've already been separated one time. And I can tell it, there may be another one coming. Well, in that context, a little bit of worry and anxiety about all three would not be uncommon. If I'm a parent and my son has cancer, I would be worried about him. Uh, in fact, it would be unusual for me not to be worried about him. If, if you were interviewing a client and they're like, yeah, I don't really care. I'm not worried about if he dies. I mean, you and I would say, I'm not right about that, right? So anxiety in that context with my son would be typical. If I'm worried about my job and I tell you as a client that, well, the reason why I'm worried about my job is because people are getting laid off and my job and my boss said no one's job is safe. Well, that's not that would not be necessarily inappropriate to worry then because that that so so there's a there's sort of a there's sort of a, an appropriateness to that worry. And if my wife and I or my husband my husband and I are married and to each other and and I'm worried about that and I, and I ask my client, well, tell me why you're worried about you and your, your husband. And they say, well, because we fight all the time and he's threatened to leave me. And the other the other night I thought about leaving. Well, see, that fits. Does that make sense? That that kind of fits. So worrying and so worrying about those situations kind of fits, we would say. That's not generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder would be the client who comes in and says, I'm terrified my son is sick. I'm terrified I'm losing my job. I'm terrified my husband's going to leave me. And you say, tell me why. Is your son ill? No, he's never been sick a day in his life. Are you about to lose your job? Well, no, I just got promoted. Is, or why, why are you worried your husband's going to leave you? I don't know. I just know he is. And she talks about how or your, your client talks about how, you know, their marriage is great. But yet, in spite of in spite of son being well, job going awesome, marriage being pretty strong, pretty normal, there's still fear and excessive worry and anxiety. That is more an example of generalized anxiety. If that makes sense, free floating anxiety, worrying about a number of different things, not just one, worrying over a number of different things, really for without justification. That's really really important to keep in mind as well too. Now I want to say this before we talk about before we wrap up this little video. I've talked about these five different mental health you know, conditions, anxiety related disorders in this section. Specific phobia, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, and generalized anxiety disorder. Now the key thing to keep in mind with all five of these is there can be some overlap between the five of them. So would so could someone have both panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, sure, they could meet the so a, a person could meet the criteria for both of those, sure. Could someone have social anxiety disorder and panic disorder, sure. They could have unexpected, unexplained panic attacks, panic disorder, and then they also too could have the symptoms of social anxiety. So, so, so there there could be an overlap, and there often is an overlap between these five different. So I'm giving them to you, and we're covering them one each one individually, distinctly. But oftentimes there's a lot of overlap, and especially to the next two disorders we're going to talk about in the next module. In the next module, we're going to talk about two very, very commonly diagnosed disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And even when we add those two, because those really, those two disorders, OCD and PTSD, are also really anxiety-related disorders as well. And so there's really six if you want to add those two to the, these four. And often among those six, there is an often a lot of overlap. And again, as I said in our very, very first video, and in the, imagine in the middle of those six, there can also be lots of symptoms of major depression or substance abuse or bipolar disorders because anxiety and um, mood disorders and anxiety and substance use disorders often run together as well too. So in this section, these five different disorders, uh, these five different general anxiety related disorders, go through, look at every single one of the videos, look at the PowerPoint presentation, Look at your lecture notes and anything else I posted for you as you do your homework for this module, you do your quiz for this module. Come back the next module and we'll talk about obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. Have a great couple of weeks. I'll see you next time.